Hello and welcome everyone to episode 10 of Talking Shop with Tony Abbey. My name is David Quinn, Chief Marketing Officer here at NAFEMS, and I'll be your host for today. This series is part of our wider community programme of online events that we're delighted to be bringing you. You can see more details on the NAFEMS and Ethics Training websites and hopefully find something else of interest as well. This week, Tony's looking at spider elements. We will be kicking off with a 30 minute presentation as usual. We will be sprinkling a couple of polls in there as well, so please uh, look out for those. Then we'll open things up to your questions. So without wasting any more time, I'll hand you over to Tony. Thank you very much, David. And um, as David says, welcome to session 10. And I couldn't resist this. Um, basically, where is Spider-Man? I believe David um, spotted Spider-Man. I, I didn't see him, but never mind. Um, he was trying to persuade Spider-Man Peter Parker to give this presentation. He's obviously got a passion for FEA and NAFEMS, but uh, he, he, wouldn't, he didn't show up. Apparently he did, but I didn't see him. So you kind of stuck with me for the next hour. And uh, these are big boots to follow, so to speak. And then on <laughs> LinkedIn and so on, there's been a terrible number of puns about um, it's a web presence and so on, but we won't, we won't go into all of that. So um, getting a little bit more serious now, um, spider elements, they play a big role in, in FE analysis. Um, it's an unofficial term. You probably won't see it in a lot of um, um, uh, manuals. Um, particularly the more stuffy kind of manuals that they won't talk about spider elements. It's an unofficial term uh, I tend to use because the, they're spider-like. That's why I call them spiders. So basically, it, a spider element allows connection between nodes in a structure. We've got the body of the spider in the middle here, and then the feet. Um, the feet uh, are the end of the legs. And OK, a spider doesn't have feet, but again, I'm, I'm kind of pushing the analogy there. Um, we don't have a limitation of eight legs. I did on a training course once. A guy asked me, um, so can we only have eight legs in the spider elements? You can have as many as you like. You can come down to one. And the biggest number I've ever used is probably about 5,000 connecting an um, uh, enforced motion of a, of a nuclear power station. So as many as we like. And the two key forms of the element, infinitely rigid and then conversely uh, infinitely flexible. We'll talk about the difference between those two. So the idea of the spider element here's uh, on the right here is a spider connected into uh, into a mesh, and um, we've got a body node I've called it, which is is the reference node, and then we've got connected nodes or feet. So again, you, you've got one body node in the middle, as many as you like for the connected nodes. That's the fundamental patterning of the element. Here I've shown it in a 2D plane, but it can be uh, 3D. So this can be uh, sticking up out of plane, uh, whatever we want to do with it, as as the um, as the, the um, need arises. And um, if we look at the quick comparison between the two types, we've got um, rigid spider. And what I've done here is to take a little plate, and I've got a circular cutout in the plate. I put a spider from the center point out to the periphery of that, uh, that hole there. And um, I've loaded it first off with one independent. So um, in a rigid spider, the, the body is independent. And then the other guys around here are dependent. And I've only connected to the um, translational degrees of freedom in the periphery here. So if we look at the sideways view, the key thing is, as I push up, that side view shows that we're completely flat there. So it, it's stiffening up the, um, the, the, the structure, what I call the backing structure. If I go further and actually put all degrees of freedom on the edge of the spider here, now it's not. Here I've got rotation at the top. Down here, I, I'm enforcing no rotation. So it's actually, it's like a um, continuous uh, slope curvature here and then kind of bleeds off through here. And that's the subtle difference between those. So again, stiffer, a uh, very stiff uh, connection in here. So it's pumping load in from the center point out to the periphery, but it's also stiffing up the backing structure. And that's the essence of the, of the rigid spider. The flexible spider, by contrast, um, I've applied the load in the middle. Same kind of idea. The spider here is connected. Uh, its periphery is connected down to the edge of the plate. And if we took at the side view, um, I've just here used just the translations. And there's just a continuous slope curvature through here. So what it's doing is it's applying the load, transferring the load, beaming it in the same way. And actually, we'd get the same reactions coming up to these points. But it's not stiffening the backing structure up. It's letting the backing structure basically do whatever it wants to do. So this is the, this is the flexible spider. If I go and put in all degrees of freedom, it doesn't make any difference in this particular case. Um, because it's so flexible, it doesn't matter whether I constrain 
just the translations or the translations and the rotations. So that's in essence the difference between them. One, um, it stiffens up the structure. We get a load path through, but it's stiff stiffening up the structure. And the other one, we get the same load path through, but it's, it's allowing the structure to, to deform. And depending on what we want to do, that's the essential choice we make between those, uh, that whether we can use a flexible spider or, or a rigid spider. Um, and we'll go, we'll go through a few examples of, uh, of use, a different usage. And this um, a kind of a summary then, load is beamed, rigid and flexible spider, the, the difference between them. Load is beamed from the body node to the feet nodes. Just, it's just like a bulk group. You can actually do a bulk group analysis on this. So the forces and moments can be applied. Um, now, I've, I, and this is the center point here. So this is what I'm referring to in the second uh, bullet point here is the, uh, is the body. Um, we can, here I put a vertical force on. I could put uh, horizontal forces. I could put a moment in there. And these will be uh, these will be beamed out. So that's basically the idea. So the rigid spider, so the load in, introduction or load transfer is similar, but then the rigid spider, as I said, stiffens. The flexible spider doesn't stiffen at all. It's actually got zero stiffness. It doesn't add any stiffness into the model whatsoever. And that's that's a very kind of very important point. Now I think at this point, David, we're going to have a quick poll. Um, do you want to kind of launch the poll? Not quite sure how we do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the poll was launched while you were talking there. We oh, thought, okay. Uh, okay. Forty percent of people said they use spider elements occasionally. Uh, Thirty-three percent said they use them all the time, and twelve percent don't use them ever. And only seven percent uh, were still asking what are spider elements. Okay. Okay. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Um, for those of you who never use them, this is perhaps a opportunity. That's very interesting. Um, maybe at the end we can kind of re resubmit that poll, David. It'd be interesting to see as we perhaps gather more people, or maybe we convince people they should use spider elements. That'd be cool. Thank you very much for that. Um, so um, things you can do with spiders sounds a very weird thing to be saying in a in a technical presentation. So quick overview of rigid spiders. Things you can do with a rigid spider include applying a load through a rigid connection, as as we've seen. We can connect parts of a model together. I can connect in a lumped mass, I can constrain a group of nodes, or I can enforce motion on a group of nodes. The last two are very similar. I go through a couple of examples of, uh, of each of those kind of applications. There's so many versatile uh, usages that uh, really I kind of had to cut the, um, the number of uh, examples short, because otherwise I could have gone on for probably an hour or so. Connecting parts of structure of a model together. This is uh, an oil rig jacket. I've decided I wanted to model this with beam elements just for uh, for simplicity. The overall beam response is is key. If I took the CAD model of all the intersections in here and so on, be a huge model, a lot of a lot of elements. If I went to shell meshing or solid meshing, so it's a great response overall. But the joints, like the little joint in here, I get I just get no indication of the local stresses. They're just not available from there. So what I can do is I can actually do um, a little bit of local global modeling in situ. The local model is the, is the joint here, and it's made up of shell elements. But I want to connect it into the global model. And I call it in situ because I'm doing it in space, in, in, in place. And so the beam elements are running down in here. There's a spider here, spider here, and another spider here. So three spiders in this, this diagram. And what they do is they uh, transmit the load um, from the beam representation to the shell representation. I've used rigid spiders because I want to have that cross-section. Um, cross-sections remain plain, no local overlying, and so on because of the presence of the surrounding pipe. So that's the decision I made to go to rigid elements. Um, again, the local stresses around here we know from the, I think one of the very early lectures, uh, St. Bennett's theorem, um, we, they would be a little bit dodgy. But we come one diameter away, and particularly around the joint here, we get good results. So that's a classic application of uh, connecting parts of the model together. Um, we want to connect in a lump mass is another application of rigid spiders. So here I've got a plate, and I've got a pretty massive structure connected to it. Now I'm assuming it's bolted or bonded down. This is actually part of a seeker head connected to a plate. And um, if I say I'm doing a dynamic analysis, I'm just not interested in the resonant frequencies of that. Uh, stiff part of the structure, they're way up there. 
It's really the interaction between that stiff structure and the flexible plate I'm interested in. So what I can do there is I can just say, well, let's put um, a node in here at the center of gravity, and then let's put um, the mass properties of this structure into that uh, center of gravity point. Now, a lot of preprocessors automate that process. You can point towards, say, some geometry, uh, it could be CAD geometry or geometry you've imported, and say, interrogate that geometry, give me the center of gravity, put a node there, and then the mass properties, which will include the mass and the mass moments inertia, stick them on that bump mass element in there, and then connect to whatever region I pick up. So presumably I've got a geometric uh, surface here, and I say connect that one to many. So here I've got a spider with probably about um, three or 400 feet in there. So um, what happens then is this is the full model, and I've run this as a back-to-back -back comparison. There's the full model. There's the first mode, which is going to be the flexible rocking about the long axis. Um, and we look at the spider representation and haven't shown the values, but it's within half a percent of the frequency there. And the same thing across the short axis, I get another mode there. And again, it's across that, that axis, uh, axis there. So the decision there is that this is a stiff structure. It's a stiff component. I'm not interested in dynamically in, the, in this coupling with the plate. If this was a more flexible component, then it wouldn't really work. This was just some sort of very flexible bracket, then it perhaps would be bad modeling to use in that particular case. That's the kind of decision you have to make. Sometimes I defeature structures because I'm just not interested in local modes. They kind of get in the way. So I might defeature doing something like that. Again, it's a bit of a, um, uh, again, a, a judgment call, as in a lot of things in FEA, but very, very powerful. And this automated process, which is now available in many, many processes, preprocessor means I didn't have to go in and calculate these properties by hand, which was which in the bad old days, that's what we'd have to do. So it's a very powerful kind of approach. Um, I want to just constrain a group of nodes, which is the other application. Here I've got a beam. I'm working up. It's a solid model of a beam. Um, it's a CAD model, and I've meshed it with, with elements. But I haven't decided what I'm going to do with the lugs at the moment. I know the lugs are going to be simply supporting, like a pivot point at each end, so these pink blobs actually are a, a, a spider element at each end there. Um, so I'm rigidizing the cut face of the I-beam. Same kind of idea. So beam plane sections are going to remain plain. Um, the only thing to watch out for here is I put a little note in. If I just set this up, pivot here and pivot here, we've actually got a rigid body motion. And that's a classic little trap. So we need a torsional constraint at one end or the other or both. Um, again. Um, <laughs> on the introduction to FEA course, which actually starts next week, I would mention. Uh, we kind of cover lots of things like that. David's grinning because he, he likes that marketing. Enforced motion on a group of nodes. I've got um, uh, a gantry structure here, and we use this on the current dynamics course, uh, e-learning course, so there's another little plug. And we want to drive this base. Um, and on the uh, advanced dynamics course, we actually get this kind of sign gantry. We put it as a seismic analysis, like an earthquake analysis. And then we also launch it into space on the space shuttle of the old cargo bay there. So we want to put in forced motion accelerations into the base. But I don't want to grab every single node on there. I want to just basically uh, spider them to a single datum point and then drive that datum point. That then drives all the others. In this particular case, I'm going to be driving it in the vertical axis, which is the z-axis. So at that body node uh, there, I will leave the body node free, the translation in z, and I will constrain all the other degrees of freedom. So it can only move in that direction. Um, and I, here I'm showing a large mass method, or I can apply direct enforced motion. Um, and what, what's very powerful is I can check, particularly if I'm putting this input load in, or this input acceleration in, um, then I can check to see if that input equals output, which is a fundamental check we should always do by actually picking off that single node point and say, in the post-processor, show me the acceleration time history of that. We should see that input echoed back out in here. In general, we can take for, um, if this was a, a reaction, for example, if this was grounded, then we could actually pick off reactions here. So again, it's very powerful. We just got a single point, which is summarizing the load transfer through there. Very, very, very useful um, and general application. So. Um, Things you can't do with rigid spiders. Uh, don't step on each other's feet. Um, so here's two speed spiders trying to share a foot feet, their feet. 
Um, each foot is dependent on its own body. So this guy's foot is dependent on the motion of the body. So independent of the center of the body, dependent on the foot. If you try and share a feet, that the, the pair of feet there is going to be a single node, and that node saying, well, who am I supposed to obey, this guy or that guy? So it has a bit of a uh, schizoid re re response there, and basically um, it causes confusion and it'll be a fatal error. It won't run in an FE analysis, so watch out for that. You need to move things away a little bit. Uh, there's lots of techniques there, but it's easy to overlap and join them up by mistake, so don't do that. Um, also, you can daisy chain. <laughs> this is a rather bizarre looking picture here, but I can connect the, the leg to the body, uh, or the foot to the body, foot to the body, and like that. I wouldn't recommend more than one or two levels. Um, we had a, a structure many, many years ago that uh, we had a, you, you build up a circular dependence, and then it won't run. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine, ex-colleague, he actually figured out a macro to figure out where the circular dependence was. So there's a lot, a lot of effort there. I think I can't remember if it was a client model or one of our models now. So don't, don't daisy chain. But body to body looks a little bizarre here. That's actually quite useful. I've got a rigid element here, which is connected to the periphery of this structure, and then an, another rigid element connected to the periphery here. I'm sharing the same the, the bodies; they're just um, equivalents for nodes there, or join the node up. So I put a pressure in here and a reactant in here. Silly little model, but just showing that back to back can often be a very, very useful kind of uh, application of the uh, of the rigid elements. It's kind of a very great convenience there. So um, one warning about um, meshing with spider elements. I dropped something, but oh, my glasses. Oh, sorry, hang on. Be careful for spiders down there, Tony. <laughs> it's funny you should say that. <laughs> I actually love spiders. I see spiders around. I don't tell my wife because I think they're going to suck up all the, the bad insects. But if I tell her, she'll come along and squash them. So. Um, sorry, put them on the side there. Um, so what, just a warning on meshing with spiders. Here's an example where I've got a hole in a plate, and I'm using two plates connected together with a beam element. Uh, I can put some springs in to represent bearing stiffness, but then basically spidered out the plate here. That's great. I can recover the connector forces and so on. Um, the local stresses are poor, but they're better than a singularity we talked about the other week. Um, but the trouble is, if I decide to re-mesh um, the shell, I decide to get finer mesh or whatever, um, some preprocessors will not update the spider. So the spider is basically sits there with the original feet. Let's say this new mesh is in here, and they're not connected up. So you've got one very angry disconnected spider. So watch out for that. Some are slicker, some are smarter. They will update everything. But just again, watch out for that. The most, the two that I mainly use, you've got to remember to go in and manually do that. Other time, otherwise, every time you rerun, it's like, oops, I've got rigid body motion. What's going on? I forgot to to re to basically reconnect the spider element in there. So. Um, Flexible spiders, just as a quick reminder, the single body node is now dependent on all the other nodes. So we're kind of flipping things around. This body is going to say, wherever these guys go, these are all independent, I will track them. And actually tracks them in a kind of a least squares moving average. So it actually implies the force, beams the force out to the independent nodes in the same kind of way. But then, however the nodes move, it tracks them. That's how we get the flexibility, so-called flexibility coming in. So it's infinitely soft in that particular case. So some examples would be connecting a beam to a tube, where I want the tube now to overlies rather than forcing it to remain a constant cross-section. Payload mass to inertia loading with stiffening. And then datum points in a fuselage so that I can use plot elements. So I'll describe uh, these, these three applications in here. So this is um, a fuselage. And I'm interested in the stresses around the cutout of the, the door here. Um, so we've got shell elements, we've got bar elements, and this is a typical kind of prototype structure. I've got a, a floor running across here as well. Now, this end, um, I'm not too concerned about stresses at that end. You can use the principle and constrain that um, as a rigid spider, using a rigid spider. That's going to grab hold of that frame, making an infinitely stiff frame. Um, a flexible spider is not possible. Uh, I'll kind of talk about that in a slide or two. This is the end I'm interested in. I'm going to load that with a rigid spider 
and then a flexible spider. And we'll see the difference between using those um, two approaches in this particular uh, application. So we see here that I've applied a vertical bending, and it actually starts this position, and it actually, uh, with the, the bending axis I've moved, it, it kind of moves down. So we look at the rigid first off. It just basically, this is the end flexing of the free end, and it moves down. You can see it just maintains its circular cross section. So it's like having an infinitely rigid frame in there. And I don't want that because I basically want to have um, some flexibility around here. So whatever I put in as the frame in here, I want that to be picked up properly. So maybe the stresses around here are more representative. So in that particular case, um, I don't want to use the rigid spider. The flexible spider, as it bends down, I've got a floor coming across here, and the floor actually constrains both edges there, so it can't bulge out. But you notice this weird kind of overlization of the fuselage. I've got that window or that door in there, so that's giving some non-symmetric flexibility, and that's being picked up by that frame representation. Same kind of idea with a vertical shear. Apply a pure shear load. Rigid, it just kind of moves down. Flexible, again, I get a non-symmetric response because of that um, because of the presence of that uh, that door cutout. So um, for um, avoiding longer lengths to, to kind of diffuse uh, rigid, so-called rigid frame in, then that basically is, is the technique we use here. Otherwise, um, if I put a rigid spider in here, that would be a frame which would be probably more suitable to like a submarine, massive kind of bulkhead and frame sitting there. So I want to have that flexible so that um, it doesn't uh, affect the, um, the stresses uh, too much in this region here. It's not kind of over constraining the model. Um, another application is I want to get uh, payload mass for inertia loading to a deck without stiffening. This is a helicopter a deck and a floor. These are uh, the seat rails running longitudinally down here. And underneath the carpet on like a, uh, in your like, typical airliner, if you you pull the carpet up, well, don't pull the carpet up, but have a look. There's like little latching points. So there are very stiff um, components here or seat rail connected down to, we hope, to, to primary structure down underneath. Now, in this particular helicopter, um, this was a, a kind of a derivative of a project I did. Um, we, we can swap out um, passengers for cargo. Um, everything is going to get attached to the seat rail in some, some way. So we could actually have seats and passengers or troops connected in there. Or we can then take the seats out, and then these become lashing points. We can put little shackles in and connect down. So the loading is going to be varying all over the place. So it's very convenient to here have a flexible spider coming up to a center gravity point. I can either put a mass there and use inertia load, or I can just put the force in there. So I can move the CGs around. I can delete the elements. Um, some solvers now, you can actually have the presence of these uh, rigid elements as case dependent. So you can actually have, say, 20 load cases with these guys moving around all over the place, which is a pretty neat idea. So I can change those CG levels very quickly. I can change the datum, uh, the, the load levels. But the key thing is the floor is not stiffened by the cargo or passengers. So whoever's designing, say, the 787 uh, Boeing, they, they've got the fundamental bending stiffness of that fuselage. They can't say, well, we've got... 200 seats in there, and the seats are going to be stiff. They're going to stiffen us up in, in uh, bending. You're not allowed to use what's called secondary structure to add to the to the, uh, the bending stiffness. And this would be a typical way of doing it. Although in practice, there would be a slight stiffening of, of, say, particularly heavy seats. We're going to ignore it. If it's just a lash down cargo, then there's no stiffening. So again, not stiffening the backing structure, but getting that load transfer in is, a, is the absolute application there. Now, things you can't do with flexible spiders, I mentioned um, before, you, uh, I was reluctant. I, I said you can't constrain, um, you can't have a, a flexible spider at the left-hand end of that fuselage because basically the body node is now dependent on the feet. So it says, okay, I'm going to track and follow wherever the feet go. Remember, this is, is flipped on its head now. If you just constrain, grab hold of that and try and constrain the body, the body node saying, well, what do I do? Obe what do I obey? The constraint here or the independent motion of the nodes there, and it can't do both, it's going to cause confusion, and again, it's going to be a fatal error. So again, something to watch out for. We can apply constraints to uh, rigid spiders because there the body is independent. We can do what we like with it. 
Um, you don't attach each other's bodies. <laughs> Again, it's the same idea. Two very angry spiders here because basically here this um, body is supposed to be dependent on these guys and this body is dependent on these guys, I now merge those two nodes together and there's a big conflict. So again, confusion, fatal error. So just a couple of traps to, to avoid there. Now the terminology of spiders, um, I kind of agonized over this a little bit. The, the, I'm calling them spider elements. Um, I, I must admit, I kind of grew up mainly with Nastran um, and that kind of arena. So there we call them rigid uh, spiders, RBE2, flexible spiders, RBE3. Just a quick word there, the actual definition is rigid body element type 3, which is infinitely flexible. I don't know who came up with that particular terminology, but um, again, it's, uh, um, that's what it is. So a rigid and flexible, that terminology tends to get kind of mapped across in general, uh, general speak. Um, so we sometimes find it used in other, uh, other codes. ANSYS, for example, the flexible spider, they call it an RBE3. Um, or I think if you're going through Workbench, um, it's called Remote Point Flexible. The rigid spider is a different definition, uh, Remote Point Rigid, if you're going through Workbench. Abacus terminology is rigid spiders, uh, coop 2D, coop 3D. Uh, they're coupling type um, element, and it's either kinematic, meaning that it, it, it is effectively rigid, it's a kinematic relationship, or distributed. Um, again, uh, I'm not... Um, I've used most of these. Um, again, if anybody has any corrections or updates on these, I'd be I'd very welcome. Now we come to the CAD embedded solvers. The general idea here is that um, in general, they tend not to describe these as elements. Um, you're trying to, in a CAD embedded, get on with the job. You don't want to get kind of stuck down with jargon necessarily. So a lot of the uh, spiders that actually being created, these element types are actually implicit in the functionality being uh, addressed. So for example, you may have uh, a remote uh, uh, load or remote mass, for example, in, spo in solid SolidWorks, and you're thinking about that load or that mass. You're not thinking about a particular element type. You, there's a, a little a box to click to say whether it's going to be rigid or flexible, but it's basically you're getting on with like the application. So um, same thing with um, constraining bodies together. It's more of a, a kind of a workflow rather than saying this is an element we're going to apply to do this job. It's what is the job you want to do. Then behind the scenes, the element is applied. So uh, that's why the terminology varies tremendously. But I think still the fun same fundamental approach applies. There are some differences and there are some subtle differences in the action of some of these, particularly the flexible spider element. So it's always best to experiment to see what action each application applies. And that's just not true for the CAD embedded, but for all of these, it, when you're trying them out for the first time, try little models and just make sure there's no uh, un, unusual kind of behavior. And, and there can be from time to time. Um, uh, there's some odd things can happen. I've covered some of them, but not all of them. So I've called them elements. Are they really elements? No, they're not actually. So uh, this is like the big reveal. Um, the rigid elements are actually using simple displacement relationships. They're a set of what we call multi-point constraints which link degrees of freedom together, like say in the x direction at node one is connected to the x direction in node two. So if I imagine I've got a, a rod, for example, it's just gonna move that rod along if I've got end one and end two in there. And there's thousands and thousands of these connected, uh, generated automatically. So um, we have just a displacement relationship and load transfer is achieved through equilibrium. And the, the um, image here is um, when I worked for a particular software company, the, um, the reference or the, the theory manual for the uh, rigid elements was just a couple of, couple of sheets of paper, three or four sheets of paper, maybe two sheets of paper, and that was it. You come to the flexible elements, they are actually much, much more complicated. They've got to achieve this load transfer through equilibrium. But as I mentioned, that dependent body node is saying, okay, I've applied the load to the independence through the body, um, through the legs, if you like, and now see where they go, and I'm going to track them. So um, it's to achieve that, it uses a complex energy minimization method, and it, that manual was about 30 to 40 pages thick. Um, people have tried to reverse engineer um, the RBE3 type elements. It's a very tough deal to do that. And this is where you're going to find different behavior in different um, software implementations, different solvers, because they're doing 
subtly different things. They're trying to do essentially the same job, but how they approach it is different. So some of the spin-offs, if you do various things, the various actions, you're going to get different effects coming in, which is why I give the warning, just, just try these out, particularly the, the flexible elements. So some of my favorite uh, examples. In early design, this is the beam I talked about. I haven't worked up the end detail of the lugs yet. I don't care about that. I'm going to focus on sizing the, the uh, overall beam and the load attachments. So this is my worked up beam. I'm taking horizontal loading. We're taking vertical loading. And then finally, once all that is settled down, then I sort of focus on the end here. And I really like that as a design approach. I try and um, kind of encourage designers to use that. Use the feature tree, move back up the feature tree, come back to a simple beam, put in, um, uh, say, a rigid element and then, uh, with a pivot, and then work up this. Then you can slide back down and start to sort of work up this. So that gives us a great deal of versatility in, in our design um, and basically stops us getting kind of hung up on uh, the detail of the end bracket here, uh, end, end lug, um, too early on in, in the design. So um, we worry about that later, and here I'm now worrying about it. I can take the forces from my RB2 reaction values. I could do some hand uh, calculation, for example, sizing of the, the bosses and so on in here, and get, some, get the, the job going, and then work up the detail a little bit later on. So lots of brackets, bolting details, things like that, or just a component I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with yet. I can just put it in as either a flexible or rigid spider. So uh, I, one of my kind of crusades is to try and bring this, I think this is quite useful workflow for, for designers who are really trying to use FEA to, to guide them uh, in their the design process. This is um, a 3 two, one method, which is a minimum constraint technique. Basically, um, I only have to apply six degrees of freedom to this model, and then I can put a balance set of loads on. So here's the balance set of loads in this particular crank. Um, but there are two issues here. First off, if it's a complex um, set of loading, how do I figure out the, the balancing forces? Um, that's tough. What I can do here is put a rigid spider in at that point, and I've got all my action going through here, and then my reaction the rigid spider is going to tell me what my reactions are, so that's great. I can then re reapply them back, get rid of the rigid spider, and then I can run the just the, the applied loads. This is the um, uh, the minimum constraint set, the three, two, one set in here. That's my um, minimum constraint model, and that's great. Um, the only trouble is that the deflections will all be relative to that point there, which can be embarrassing. But what I can do is put now a flexible spider in here. And I've got a datum point in here. Again, it's adding no stiffness to the model. And quite a few pre, uh, post processes allow us to say, show the deformations relative to some other grid point, which will be that point there. And then everything's relative to that point there. So and to set up the loads, to kind of visualize the deflections, again, very, very useful approach. Um, this is one of my favorites. I'm using a flexible spider to simplify viewing modes. You might think, what on earth am I doing here? Well, this is a full model of a ship. And I want to know uh, declutter uh, the complex local modes so that I can just see what is the overall bending and torsional modes of the hull on its own. So what I've done is to each of the bulkheads here, I put a flexible spider in, which takes, the, again, remember that average or least squares moving average of the peripheral nodes here and says the dependent node is going to move and chase these others. Uh, the black line is where I've used plot-only elements to connect them up. So when I just visualize with the plot only elements, I only see that bending of the, of the beam. I've added no, no stiffness with either the red elements or the black elements in here. I put a little side uh, tag on there so I can see torsion as well. I used to use this a lot with helicopters. Helicopters are like a flying dynamics laboratory to try and figure out, so particularly like torsional modes uh, in the helicopter and the panels and all sorts of things, windows and so on, all popping off, got local modes and so on. So you're kind of decluttering. So this is the idea. This is a particular bulkhead station. There's my dependent node. These are all the independents. They're doing whatever they want to do. I'm not stiffening them up. I'm just pulling off that center point. I'm using that as a datum point, and I'm going to recover that and then link them together with these plot-only elements. So if we get um, these modes in here, this is a bunch of modes which are very complicated. There's some overall bending and torsion going on, but I've got lots of local modes in here as well. 
I used to use this for um, naval shock applications as well, just to understand what's going on. I want to know for the hull, what is the bending and torsional predominant modes in there? But it's tough to figure out what on earth is going on in there. So with the, um, the spider elements, this is the top view, and then this is the same modes. I can see there's a lateral bending going on here. Um, there's no uh, other lateral bending at all going on here. Uh, looking at the side view, there's some vertical bending going on. There's vertical bending on here, but these little tags here are showing me the torsion. Um, these tags are in the horizontal plane. These are staying in the horizontal plane. This one has kind of, ro and now I'm looking vertically. So this, um, uh, sorry, looking sideways on. So this horizontal tag has dropped down here. So I can sort of see the, the bending, the torsion quite nicely. So I can figure out what the hull is doing and the rest of the structure is completely, um, it, it's not included. Now these points are, are very accurate points because I'm slaving off very accurately. So when I slave off the central point in here, I'm not degrading the response model in any way. So it's not like um, an average um, value or, or, or a kind of a coarse model value. It's a highly accurate value, which is the mean uh, motion, if you like, of the peripheral running around in here. So it is good quality data that I'm pulling off, but I'm just simplifying the view. Now, if you don't have plot-only elements, uh, a lot of codes don't, um, I think about it um, a few weeks ago. What you can actually do is to put in a very, very flexible um, beam. So put in a uh, thin wall beam. So here I've got a rectangular beam. Here it's a circular beam. You make a very, very thin wall indeed. Put a low Young's modulus in. So again, now it's slaving to this. Um, uh, this beam is being slaved to those, uh, those datum points. And if I put a rectangular beam in, I can actually get a quite a nice visualization of the bending uh, of this particular case. I can choose a rectangular beam, which is something like this. I can choose a circular beam. Unfortunately, what you don't see is torsion because um, torsion is, is, this is just a representation of a line element. Um, but So we're not going to see the torsion there unless we plot rotations, which is going to look tough. We could, I guess, we could do that. But this is quite a, quite a neat trick. And the more I thought about it, I, I would recommend that as a trick to see what's going on there. Again, these blue beam elements are adding zero stiffness into the structure. They're low stiffness in their own right, and they're slaved to the structure through um, stiffless or infinitely flexible members in there. Now the plot only elements, if I use 2D elements, which I've just slaved to the same points, so I've just got my spider points, I've connected and just kind of plated a very crude representation in here. And that's actually kind of following now uh, a lot a lot better because now I'm slaving off to the uh, some corners of that spider element. And um, it, it's actually giving me the bending as before, but now I can see the torsion very clearly. So you've got 2D plot elements slaving there. That's probably the best way to do it. Uh, you can use 1D elements, as I've said, in like a stick model. But this, this is really a great way of seeing what's going on. So this is the full model. Horrible clutter all over the place for this particular mode. This is just simplifying and saying this is what's going on fundamentally for torsion and bending of the, um, of the whole structure. Um, these two torsional modes were very difficult to figure out what's going on. They are distinct torsional modes. There's a coupling again between torsion and bending. Very difficult to visualize on the full model with everything going on. Here, uh, again, using the 2D plot elements, uh, it's very, very clear what's happening. So again, over the years, found this extremely useful for very, very busy type of structures like that. So in conclusion, um, pretty well every analyst develops his uh, toolbox of favorite techniques. Um, my toolbox includes the rigid and flexible spider elements. Um, I've actually, I've actually ditched a project that I uh, bid for and then they said on that particular project we don't want to see the use of rigid or flexible spider elements. So I thought this is going to get too messy, too complicated, so I kind of passed on that one. Um, it's like all these things, you gradually work up experience, like all tools, um, you need to read up the limitations of the tools, practice on simple models, always question the results uh, to make sure that you're applying the tool properly. So I would say this is a little bit like an advanced tool. As soon as you bring an advanced tool into your toolbox, you want to get kind of familiar with it. Um, there are further applications. There are other parameters, such as weighting functions, uh, whether you use translations or rotations. And I'm afraid there's a few more traps awaiting you. But basically, uh, do have fun with spiders. So that's uh, kind of my, my passing thought there. Sorry, Spider-Man, you weren't around. So 
at this point, David, I will remember to hand over to you to to uh, to wrap up this show for us and take us into Q and A. No problem at all. Thanks very much, Tony. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed Tony's presentation. We do have a number of questions in the Q and A box at the moment. Uh, as we you can see on the slide, we'll be posting the video of today's session onto YouTube and onto our website, nifems.org and fetraining.net. The next session is next Friday on July 17th. The registration page is already open at nafems.org for that, so you can uh, go ahead and get registered after today's session. Uh, in that session, I was very intrigued to see this title this morning, Tony. Some fun with unit conversions, uh, some horror stories. <laughs> As many viewers have waited to hear some of Tony's horror stories. Those usually happen in the bar, I guess. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, we look forward to that uh, next Friday. Uh, and as Tony's noted there, the next intro to FEA e-learning class takes place or starts on the 14th of July. So that's next week. Next week, there's also the structural optimization class, which starts next week as well. So if you want to get some more in-depth training from Tony uh, with NAFEMS, if you go to our website, you can register. Uh, for both of those courses starting, and there's a full range of classes that you can take a look through as well. That's the plug out of the way. Uh, like Tony said, I'm going to reopen uh, the poll just now, so we, most people didn't get a chance to answer that because we're just trying out these polls and things. So I'll open the poll for, for 30 seconds or so to for you to let us know if you do use Spider Elements. Uh, I'll do that now and stop rambling. I'll hand over to Tony to answer some of your questions. Okay, thanks so much, David. So, uh, first question from Chris Wright: Do all FEA software have spiders? The answer is that um, pretty much yes. Um, as I said, sometimes it's very kind of overt. That we call it a spider, and we know it's not quite an element, but we see the spider elements in there. So it's like, here's the tool, go use it. Other times it's implicit, and that's what I was trying to talk about with a CAD embedded. You might not realize you're actually uh, creating a spider element. Uh, but behind the scenes, you are doing that. Um, again, you've got to perhaps dive into the user manuals to see what's going on in there. Steve Fisher makes the point, must be careful with RBs, threes on solids. If you have independence on a solid, you should not specify rotational degrees of freedom um, as this causes singularities in the matrix. It's a very good point. Um, we've got our body, which is, um, we can say, going to be loaded. And then the feet are going to be connected down into the mesh. I've talked about how you could have the translations and translations and or rotations. This is a case where the the degrees of freedom in the solid don't have rotations. You've actually opened up a degree of freedom there which can't be satisfied. So it's a very good point, Steve. That's what I was saying. There were some more traps and so on waiting for you when you get into it a little bit more. But that's a, that's a very good kind of prediction on that. Morgan asks, could the legs of the flexible spider be connected as beams connected? by ball joints. You can, but the trouble is um, you want to get um, be, uh, stiff connections. And the danger is if we, if we say, for example, for the, let's kind of paraphrase your question, say could we have a rigid spider who actually use beams and have massive um, uh, stiff beams? We could do, but the trouble is then the conditioning between those very, very stiff beams and the rest of the structure can cause us problems, which is why we like to do the displacement relationship rather than actually put, a, if you like, a true beam element in there. In the bad old days, we used to, if you want to do nonlinear, which I, I kind of didn't mention, but um, the the old days, these elements didn't support nonlinear analysis. They would stay in their same position and they kind of be left behind. These days, many of the spiders now can actually adapt to a nonlinear um, situation. And what we used to do in the old days was actually use beam elements uh, because they, they obviously they could adapt, adapt to nonlinear. So in general, we avoid actually using truly rigid. So when we say rigid, we're just really constraining degrees of freedom together. And, and that, that gives us the rigidity without introducing undue uh, stiffness in there. Gregory makes the point, sometimes we use flexible spider elements to replace brackets or something very very happy. I guess we don't really care about what happens in these electrical boxes. Uh, how do you determine how much area to scope these spider elements to? That's a good point. Uh, usually I consider like a bolting area or a bonding area. 
if it's a flexible spider, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, it's more concerned if it's a rigid spider because then we're rigidizing the backing structure. Basically, the footprint of whatever we're connecting to. So if it's like an electrical box, we've got some electrical component which is perhaps um, bonded or soldered or tagged to, to a printed circuit board, then usually the shadow footprint of that, that uh, would be sufficient if we're going to use the flexible spiders there. Gregory uh, says as a follow-up, if you have, say, a door on three hinges, but each has a different stiffness, how would you represent this? What it starts to do there is to, to put um, spring elements or bush elements in, in the daisy chain together. So the body of the spider, we can actually connect other elements in there. So like I had the bolting, um, I had the, the, the yellow plates with the beam in between, spiders out, I said it's bolting. I put springs in there to represent the bearing stiffness. It'd be the same kind of idea there. So we can actually slip a spring element with all six degrees of freedom in the body of the spider to make it become more versatile. It's a good application. Very good point, Gregory. I didn't, didn't cover that one. Daniel says, if spider element is only an unofficial name that you use, what are the usual names in the tools? Those are the names I talked about um, when I, did, I talked about the terminology. So um, typically, kinematic would be equivalent to rigid, and then coupled would be equivalent, uh, sorry, um, uh, flexible or, or rigid would be um, uh, uh, modifications there. Sometimes they're called remote load application points, either rigid or flexible. So if, if, um, if you go back to the when the video is um, uploaded, if you go back to that slide, you'll see that the range of names in there. If anybody's got any other um, uh, names, that, uh, knowledge of names and so on, uh, and more experience in these other areas, do feel free to, to send me an email, drop me a line on that, or when the video is posted on LinkedIn or whatever, then please, uh, please add to the commentary there. Troy asked the question, how do you determine the direction of the rigid element? When, which node is the independent? Which node or nodes are the dependent? For example, if you are connecting a gusset plate made of shells to some beam elements. I, I probably wouldn't use a spider elements there. Um, I generally think of the spider element as being a one to many. There are other connector techniques you can use there. There's like a one to one connector, and I might use many one to one connectors in there or use a bonding or something like that. So usually the decision is taken for you. What is the body node, which would be a, like a single point constraint or loading area or back to back connection? And we're connecting that to, to a set of, of body nodes. Uh, Zoran says, in the example from your email, you have a ship model. Sometimes on ships with multiple decks, you have large openings in sides. So load is not transferred to the upper decks 100%, but 25 to 75%. Would you use spider elements for local model of such a ship and how? Yeah, if, if you're going to use an in situ, uh, as I did with the oil rig um, jacket, the decision there I made was that the connection was stiff. So I just spidered from a beam to, um, uh, to a set of shell elements. Um, I have uh, done a submarine model way back in the day, which was a whole overall submarine um, uh, hull, and then for the particular in areas I'm interested in around the reactor compartment, I actually spidered out to then a shell model of the reactor compartment. So again, that's a local model in situ with a global model. Um, I probably again would probably not use um, spider elements there because I probably want a many-to-many -many connection in there. So um, I would either use um, uh, bonding uh, or I probably use some um, some some kind of uh, bonded in there, like a glued a glued connection, a bonded connection between the nodes on one edge and the nodes on the other edge. Zoran continues, comparison could be made with I beam with perforated web, so much that the upper flange is not suffering as much load as the lower one. Yeah, I, again, I, I can't quite visualize the application there, but um, I, um, again, if you'd like to send me a supplementary email. I can kind of answer answer that one maybe in a later uh, broadcast. But um, Rizwan uh, says, based on what I understand from your explanation, isn't spider LM what is generally in FEA terminology referred to as a multipoint constraint? Indeed, it is. Uh, and that was the point I made in one of the slides. If When we, we see the video, you can rewind it. Um, 
The rigid spiders are nothing more than thousands of multipoint constraints. They are exactly that. They're displacement relationships. That was the point I made. U1x equals U2x is a multipoint constraint. In other words, not a single constraint which we're nailing down or, or working with, but linking constraints together or degrees of freedom together as a multipoint constraint. The flexible element is kind of an overlay on top of that. So it is a multipoint constraint relationship, but with a more sophisticated energy minimization on top of that. Florian says, how important is the uh, position of the master node or body of the spider element, for example, when using them to attach concentrated masses to a structure? It's actually very important. We want to make sure that, that um, the body node is at the center of gravity so that when we're reporting the mass moments of inertia, they are about the center of gravity point and the center of gravity, the, the, the inertia, the that all the, the points are working properly about the center of gravity there. Ivor makes the point for ComSol multiphysics, it's rigid connectors with or without the flexible option. So that's the beauty, that's the oxymoronic uh, title there, rigid connector, rigid connection, flexible type. And that's the same with the RB3 there. So thanks for that, Ivor. Florian makes the comment, with, or asks, would there be a significant difference between creating a rigid spider and creating a nodal tie between the nodes. It's really just convenience. Um, you could do that, um, but you're really doing what uh, the hard way, what the, the program is doing automatically with a so-called rigid spider element. Steve uh, makes the comment, one of the beauty of RBE3s is that each leg can have a different weighting factor, thus allowing the fact that the uh, center of gravity of the mass or loading point is not always in the geometric center of the attachment points. Steve, you open up a very interesting uh, further application of these elements, but you also open up a can of worms uh, in the sense, and I don't mean in any nasty negative way. Um, these are very advanced applications. You can actually apply weighting factors. So if you think of it, one leg can be more powerful than another, or a, a foot can have more uh, a role to say. More load will transfer down there using the weighting factors. If you know what you're doing, you've gathered experience uh, on these and you've experimented, it's a fantastic extension of the tool. If you use it carelessly, <laughs> you don't know what you're doing, disaster can result. So it's a very good point there, Steve. I, it's one of those things I put down as further applications, but again, some traps are waiting for you there. What would be an example, uh, this is from Rodrigo, of a sim good simple models to predict both rigid and flexible models. I think that um, uh, plate with a hole in it, uh, just repl replicating that example, connecting two, two plates together on, a, on an edge, so they've got maybe a plate on the left, plate on the right, and then maybe um, uh, doing a connection, maybe a back-to-back -back connection between them. Uh, just applying a single con uh, RB, RBE2 and then RB3 to the free edge and applying loading. Simple little models like that, um, just to see essentially the difference between can we see the load transfer going through and can we see the, the effect of the stiffening of the structure in there. I think Iva here in, in this question is thinking ahead to the next presentation. My favorite FEM tool has, which we all know, well, this by now Iva, has um, inbuilt easy to use full unit conversion. You just use it. Agreed, but we'll, we'll uh, that's, do come along in two weeks' time either, and uh, I might even get, ask you to do a guest spot. Um, I'm expecting to get beaten up in two weeks' time when I talk about unit conversions. I already got a little bit beaten up on the dynamics course yesterday when I <laughs> introduced one of my uh, Tony Abbey conversion uh, factor schemes. Uh, Rizwan asks the question, how could we specify the stiffness matrix of a flexible spider? Uh, we just don't. Um, basically, again, it's, it's a constraint relationship, so there is actually no element. There's no stiffness matrix implied in there. Uh, Peter makes a comment, RB2 are my favorite elements to connect large structures for vibroacoustic vibro -acoustic analysis, where the structure itself influences the dynamics, lumped mass but does not contribute much to the sound radiation, e.g. electric motor and a washing machine assembly. Absolutely. Um, I've worked with jet engines, for example, on the outside carcass of the jet engine. We've got all sorts of services bolted to it, um, usually stiff little mounting plate areas, for example, where um, control boxes and so on are attached. We're not interested in that in the overall structural response, but it's going to stiffen up locally. 
great application there many many applications i've got a printed circuit board where maybe it's a stiff little component which is bonded down again a little patch of rb2 there um, can be very very useful there okay sorry specs come on again uh, clemens asks, could you please repeat the 321 method i think i might do that um, clemens as a separate um, a webinar at some some particular point. The 321 method is a minimum constraint method. <laughs> if you come on to the introductory course, this is shameless next week, then I, I cover that in, in some detail. But um, I can certainly break out that and talk about, actually talk about that and maybe um, inertia relief would be a cool thing to talk about in a, in a future uh, webinar. Um, Callum uh, says, can you apply boundary conditions to distributed coupling node central node, center node, control node. No, we can't because the distributed, in other words, the flexible, that's a dependent body node. So if we constrain it, then basically we, 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 there's a, con, a conflict there. Um, <laughs> Steve makes a lovely comment. I like this. Not all FEA software has spiders, but they all have bugs. Absolutely. Amen to that. That's, that's, I, I really like that. I can, I can imagine that as like a little motto up somewhere. I like that. Sanjay Kumar says, what's the difference between RBE2 and RBE3? Um, on the creative video, I'll just pop up that slide and uh, just emphasize the difference again. But essentially, RBE2 is a rigid connection. It stiffens up the backing structure. RBE3 is an infinitely flexible connection. It doesn't stiffen up the backing structure. So when I'm thinking about, well, should I use one or the other? I think, OK, I want to get the load in there. Is it a stiff load transfer path, like a, a very stiff bracket? Or is it a soft load transfer path, like, for example, a cargo just lashed down to a, to a deck, or something soft, which, uh, and then I would use the RB3. So the decision is, what does it do to the backing structure? Does it stiffen it up, or does it keep it flexible? And that's essentially the choice between those two. Shahid asks, is it necessary to constrain all six degrees of freedom and RB3 elements every time? No, uh, as Steve pointed out, uh, you sometimes don't want to do that. And I should perhaps have mentioned here, um, in general, the default action is probably for the feet to only be constrained with translations. If you take that as your default, your starting point, that will keep you out of trouble. And then if you see for special cases, you might need to add rotational degrees of freedom at the feet, then, then do that. Same with the RBE2s as well. That would be a, probably a good general thing to to mention so that's actually a very good point Shahid. um so in general the feet whether they're uh, rb2 rb3 stick to three degrees of freedom the translations but then maybe bring in the rotations if you find a um a, um a, a different application does the accuracy of the flexible spider element degrade uh, this is from apov um, with the number of nodes it is attributed to. No, it doesn't. Um, the only thing to watch out there is if you've got a, a structure which is kind of completely cross-coupled with lots of flexible spiders, it can actually start to affect the overall conditioning of the, of the structure. You've got to think, what am I doing? If, they are, um, if it's just a local region and you just happen to have a dense mesh and so you're connecting a very dense mesh patch, let's say, locally to one node versus a coarser mesh, it doesn't make much difference to the answer. You're putting a little bit more demand on the on the solver, but not too much. But if, I, if I've if i got cross-connected all over the place, then I can start to really mess up the conditioning of the matrix there. Um, Peter said, I like the RB2, RB3 dichotomy as infinitely rigid flexible <laughs> yes um, when i first saw the rb3 definition and said what does rbe stand for rigid body element so type 3 is infinitely flexible rigid body element type 3 flexible it was developed in southern california who knows what they were smoking when they actually came up with uh, that description of the element type peter says i think the term spider elements is pretty well accepted across the industry i think so um it just describes very nicely what's going on. Um, in, David uh, has put in, in Creo Simulate, they're referred to as rigid and weighted links. Thank you very much for that. That's that's very useful. Uh, Calamus, is there any benefit to using a kinematic coupling, rigid, as opposed to 
MPC constraint, uh, like a lug constraint. It's really convenient. Um, MPCs, multipoint constraints, depending on the particular solver, you can get in and set them up kind of semi-automatically. Uh, um, Spider just kind of does it for you. So it's really, it's just really convenient there, I think. You, you said, uh, this is from Tim, you, you said that flexible spiders have different implementation and might behave differently. What are the differences one might ex observe? It's the couple, it's more the flexible spider and the, the way that it couples together. Um, and for example, the way it transmits moment um, can be different between them. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but diving into the diving into the implementation, some some software actually says beware. And there's actually some software I've noticed has different evolutions. Like some um, kind of sort of emulated the let's say the RB or the classical RBE three type behavior, um, but didn't didn't completely emulate it. And then later versions of the same software emulated it more. It, it's a bit difficult to, to kind of generalize there. I, I just just be very careful uh, and, and read carefully and, and do some some test studies on there. Um, Oscar said at the beginning you said that rigid elements constrain all six degrees of freedom and flexible elements just three. Um, no, I don't think I quite said that, Oscar. Um, the body node can have uh, six degrees of freedom. Uh, in both senses applied as a load um, and in the RBE2 sense the rigid element can be strained constrained in all six degrees of freedom the feet for both types can have just uh, the translations or the translations and the rotations so potentially each end the body and the feet can have six if I said that wrong I do apologize I, I, I think I um, I did um, uh, well, anyway, I apologize if I miss, you miss I, I misled you there. Keeman says, isn't RB3 also just spreading the loads in a statically admissible manner? Uh, Clemens, sorry. Yes, it is, but it also has that body node, the dependent node tracks the deflection of the, um, of, of the independent node. So that's what gives it its flexibility. So it's a two-sided thing. I sometimes think it's like a feedback loop simplistically saying we apply the load at the body node it then as you say spreads the loads in a statically admissible manner to the independent nodes this is again the flexible spider they move and then they kind of drag the um the the body node with them that's that's the difference there uh yeah th thanks a lot for your time uh, again today Tony. and thanks everyone uh, for your questions it's great to see everyone getting involved and submitting your thoughts and your questions on it as Tony said, next week it's a busy, busy week to start with for Tony. He's got the intro to FEA, which is starting on the 14th. Uh, structural optimization, I think, is starting next week as well, unless I'm mistaken. Yes, and the next, the next session uh, of Talking Shop is next Friday as well. So some fun with unit conversions, some of Tony's favourite horror stories. I'm sure that will be another interesting session, and we hope to see everyone back here with us at the same time next week. In the meantime, the recording will be posted on YouTube and on both our websites very shortly. We thank you for attending. Uh, Bye for now. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye to Spider-Man if he's around. Thanks, Tony and David. With that, I'd like to remind everyone that you can find all this great information on the World Wide Web. No? Yeah, that's pretty bad. Anyway, you can go to fetraining.net or you can go to nafims.org. Thanks and have a great day.